Thank you, Madison. Um, it was a great privilege to be involved with so many amazing educators from so many different walks of life and experiences. That was one of the great benefits of the program. My name is Sandra Wong. I am a middle school educator. I was the sole middle school representative in the project. And um, also, I hail from Kearney, Nebraska, which is quite distinct from Arizona and also Maryland and some of the other uh, more urban environments that our teachers came from. So I have a different perspective. Um, a little bit about me. I was born in rural Nebraska. My parents actually farm there. Um, I was uh, raised there and spent the first uh, seven years of my education in a two-room country school house. Um, and then when I was in seventh grade, I matriculated to the big house in uh, the town of about 7,000 people nearby, um, which had recently invited a meatpacking plant into the community. And um, I was first kind of first in line to see a huge cultural shift in my community there. Um, I believe the statistic was something like 4% Hispanic to 40% in the course of four months. Um, and that happened in my seventh grade class as I was participating in that. And that really impacted me um, as a person and as a eventual teacher. One of the reasons I chose to teach English, Spanish, to study ELL uh, was seeing just the need of language um, as a bridge, the, the idea that cultures need to converse, need to understand each other started in that place for me. Eventually, um, I became a geography teacher, and right now I currently teach seventh grade geography um, at Sunrise Middle School in Kearney. Um, I began to travel um, just to enhance my students' understanding of the world as well as my own. Um, and my not-so-secret agenda in my classroom is to try to make all of my students into more global citizens. Um, I really want them to understand the world as a huge place and a, um, a place that has so many different perspectives and opportunities to offer. And so um, coming to the Fulbright uh, thing is a way to broaden that. Now, I show this picture because this is a picture from my parents' farm. Um, so this is what you can see standing out looking from their house there. And this is how maybe most of you picture Nebraska, whether you've been there or not. Um, if you haven't, you're in the majority. Um, these couple, first couple of pictures are from travel that I did uh, over the summers working with refugees and immigrants, first in uh, Israel and then in Germany in 2016. Uh, with Syrian refugees. Um, but these last pictures are actually pictures taken in the last few years with international students in our city. And so as I talk to my students about this um, experience that I've had, I also encourage them to interact with the international people that we do have in our community, of whom international students kind of make up the majority in many ways. Um, and so these are some of friends. We have quite a few students from Japan, from Korea, some from China, and uh, up until recently, uh, quite a large number of girls from the Sultanate of Oman, which is fabulous. They're some of my good friends. So welcome to middle school. Um, if you have a middle schooler, you know this is pretty much what it's like. It's um, a little bit eclectic, kind of chaotic, it's loud, um, and my students come to me from a lot of different places, but it's not maybe as diverse a perspective in Nebraska as you would get in some urban environments. Um, I have about 82% students who identify as white and then 14% Hispanic, um, and then just a few African American and Asian students. Um, my goal for becoming a part of, applying to and becoming a part of Fulbright Hayes was uh, a couple of things. One was I really wanted to, um, again, take that opportunity to explore a part of the world. I'd been in Africa and the Middle East and Europe. I had not spent as much time in Asia. Um, and so I was hoping to really um, get a better picture of especially China as China figures into so many of our uh, different things. But I also had this in impacting me. Uh, this is my husband, who I married a year and a half ago, a native of Taiwan. And so Mandarin is his uh, native language, and I was thinking about uh, future children of mine who will call two cultures their home, and uh, wanting to understand that from a better perspective. Uh, we came to the project with, as Wen Hao mentioned, several different things in mind, and uh, one of the things I really appreciated was the emphasis on journaling. Um, I am a writer as well as a teacher, um, and I like what Ben Arya and Inash said, journaling is an integral part of qualitative research, an excellent method to identify themes and patterns in the data. Um, and Heyman, Wilkes, and Jackson mentioned journaling is known as reflective, a reflective process. One writes down everything seen and heard, then once away from the research, reflects on that information to gain um, to again identify 
uh, themes and patterns. And that's really what I was looking for, was the themes and the patterns of my experience. So I kept an extensive journal while we were in Shanghai. I produced about 70 pages of single page text. Um, so when I got back, as I was reading through that, I began to think about how did these things impact me? And what I'm going to share today for just briefly are some of my journal entries from that time um, and then talk about how those have impacted my classroom and the stories, the narratives that I'm telling my students this year because I've been uh, in China. So this first entry, it says it took some time and a bit of practice uh, a bit of persistence to the cab, which seemed like the quickest way to get to the tombs, but eventually Google Translate and I, because I was a very low speaker in Mandarin, uh, along with the patience of a very sweet cab driver, managed to make a connection. The humility of being a language learner here comes fully into play when I travel on my own. Most of the time, someone in our group who speaks more and better Mandarin than I will do the honors, but alone I am forced to gra grapple with my knowledge or lack thereof. It's good for me. It reminds me what it means to struggle to put things together and forces me to admit my humanity. But it doesn't always feel so pleasant at the time. And out of this, I took uh, several experiences. We did do two hours of Mandarin class every day. Um, we did struggle hard with Chinese. I had taken a semester 20 years ago at the university as sort of as a lark, and I had not touched it since. Um, and so just going out into the world, uh, this is my colleague Amanda and I, super happy after we got someone to give us directions in Chinese and we understood them um, on the campus that we were studying on. Uh, you don't often actually see signs like this that have English on them at all. So not only do you not speak the language, you are, in essence, functionally illiterate. Um, which is a great challenge to someone who's used to writing and reading everything. Um, another opportunity, as Wenhao mentioned, we visited the Gaokao site. We were able to interview some parents um, about their system. This is my journal about that. Most of us were apprehensive about this exercise. We feared intrusion, but many of the parents, perhaps anxious to talk or just bored from their weight, were eager to wax eloquent about the system. Most of them had grown up under Gaokao and seemed to consider it an extremely fair system. None of them seemed particularly worried about their son or daughter, at least in word. Indeed, I saw many who kept glancing toward the school. There are, reasons, or there are reasons so many are passionate about taking this test. It literally determines one's entire future. A visit to a nearby temple in Nanjing further delineated this. Thousands of ribbons representing prayers of the desperate and hungry, students praying for a chance to succeed in life after high school. But what about those who have no chance? And so as we reflected on this, we visited schools, um, we looked at Chinese schools who are attempting to shift the way that they do education. We also looked at migrant workers, as Grant mentioned, um, and the uh, struggle for educational access that takes place in China. Um, I was drawn to reflect on my own experiences with the public school system and the private one, um, how education is a currency um, and there's unacknowledged equity. And I talked to my students about that. In fact, we're getting ready to take a look, a closer look at Gaokao and the thresholds of achievement in China and then turn that lens back around to look at the United States. This one is from my time in Nanjing when I got lost. Um, my phone was dying, I was alone and uh, I could not figure out how to get to the meeting place where everyone else was. Uh, so I wandered into a hotel trying to ask, is there a way to get a cab? Um, and the woman who was there, a young woman at the um, counter, spent about half an hour talking to me in Google Translate. She didn't speak English. I didn't speak Mandarin. Um, she finally was able to figure out where I needed to be. She got my phone up. She programmed it to take us to the take me to the metro station I needed, and all the way to the restaurant, um, completely went out of her way. And this was my reflection after that. It all sounds very matter of fact when I tell it now, but the truth is, with the sun going down and finding myself possibly miles from my hotel and destination both, and my phone slowly losing power, it was the simple kindness of a clerk who had better things to do that saved me in Nanjing tonight. And I wonder, just one human being to another, how would I have responded if our places were reversed? How do I respond? When I'm inconvenienced by another's lack or by another's language and culture, do I respond with grace or roll my eyes with impatience? She had every right to send me away tonight. I wasn't a guest at her hotel or anyone to her at all. She had every right to play the speak Chinese card and send me away. She chose not to. Would I? 
And these are questions that I bring up to my students who some cases have very little understanding of diversity and are tempted to keep it at arm's length, even in our community, um, to talk about the power of welcoming others, welcoming a stranger. Uh, this is from a uh, reflection a time after uh, we had visited the massacre at Nanjing Museum. We spoke of this before starting off, the reluctance of many in the group to witness this truly tragic period in history. We all agreed that it must be seen. Without being seen, how can history ever be truly understood? The bones speak to all we are and what we can be, both good and evil. Remember history, but not with hatred. This quote from Nanjing survivor Li Shuoying, I'm not going to say that right, sums up a lot of my takeaway from this. See history and don't let it happen again. Honor memory of hardship and seek peace to avoid repeating it. We can choose to be the worst of our humanity or the best of it. We can choose to see the humanity in each other's eyes outside of language and culture, or we can focus on our differences and our own crusades. But we get to choose. And so talking to my students about things like Nanjing's massacre, the Jewish resettlement of Shanghai in Shanghai that uh, during World War II, talking about opportunities in history to welcome people and to um, embrace inclusivity versus, diverse, or versus pushing people out. I'm going to go ahead and skip through some of these because I have a lot and my time is running short, but we will post the slides if people want to read further. Um, this is my colleague whom I was able to work with, um, who is a, also a middle school teacher and her middle school classroom. Um, we are still talking, still trying to set up an exchange where we can uh, work on that, although uh, WeChat as a Chinese government-funded app is not exactly what our tech people want us to use, especially middle schoolers. Here's an app for school. They don't like that. Um, talking about the uh, architecture of power and communism and capitalism, uh, inhabiting ambiguity between those two systems. Um, uh, this is the Communist Party's birthplace right here, um, and right next to it, a three-story high Prada ad. Um, so you can see the juxtaposition. In another famous incident, my uh, friend and I noted it as we were near Mao's tomb that the closest building to the tomb from a certain angle was a Starbucks. Uh, this is the marriage market, which Wen Hao talked about visiting, where parents come to sit and uh, hopefully make connections for their children for marriage. Um, and so I talk with my students about how I personally was a little judgy about this. I was like, hmm, you know, that's not, I'm a very independent person, I want my parents, you know, and how we can be that way. And then I realized my husband and I meant on eHarmony, which is kind of like just putting out an umbrella online. <laughs> Talking about the architecture of power, um, how certain things symbolize certain things, how talking about a great wall in China can then lead you to talk about the walls we build in the United States. Um, and then a last impactful visit with some parents um, during our homestay. Here are two parents whose lives were changed by Gao Kao, who left their families and homes to come and make a better life in Shanghai, now engaged in trying to understand how best to raise their son, how to love him and one another. And we covered all of that in one day, which I still cannot believe. Is this not the same struggle face the world over, the same mother's heart in Shanghai that I have seen in the jungles of West Africa and the refugee shelters of Western Europe? Perhaps I cannot fully understand because I am not yet a mother myself, but certainly I can as one who looks out over my own keepers of the future generations in my classroom each day. Identify. We all want the best for our children. Finding that inside of our own cultures and narratives is not always easy. Maybe it's not even always possible. But there is truth to be found when we know where to look. And those are my friends, Jiao Xu and Fu Bin, and their son are too. So some things that I took away, greater empathy and identity with my students, particularly those who struggle, greater awareness of educational inequity and the responsibility to advocate for students within my own system, greater awareness of my own responses to strangers in need and enhanced ability to communicate that need for compassion. Uh, greater willingness to confront my students with the witness of hard truths in their own culture and history. Continued connection of myself and students with cross-cultural relationships that inform our understanding. Greater willingness and ability to encourage students to see ideologies in practice as complex and even ambiguous. Increased ability and motivation to teach my students how to suspend judgment of customs they do not understand. Greater awareness of the architecture of power and censorship, not only in buildings, but in organizational structure. 
and increased ability to connect my students to the commonalities of humanity and challenge them to see people as people first. This is a very famous poem, which I'm sure some of you have seen before, but I read it many years ago when I was uh, student teaching, and it has stuck with me since. I believe it informs all of our ideas. I am a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no man should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers, infants killed by trained nurses, women and babies shot and burned by high school and college graduates. So I am suspicious of education. My request is help your students become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated eichmanns. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are important only if they serve to make our children more human. And that is the goal. Um, as I pause here, we're going to have a question and answer time where we'll invite your questions, but I'll leave you with this. Um, think, pair, share is something I often do in the classroom where I ask students to think to themselves, talk to someone else, share with the group. You can do that at your leisure, but think for yourself, what is one experience you've had as an educator that profoundly changed the way you saw your world and your students? And if you'd like to share that with us later, we would also welcome hearing about that. Thank you so much. Hello, yes. Oh, okay, um, so the question was what did our teachers learn from each other, what our, us teachers learned from the Chinese teachers over there, correct? Oh, and from, oh, and from, from us, oh my gosh. Um, well, that's a really loaded question. Um, I, I would say, I would say uh, for me what sticks out the most is I learned a lot about the teachers in China and how we were at East China Normal University in Shanghai, and so we were being taught by other teachers who were training to teach as well. So it was very meta. In, in that regard, we got to see, you know, we got to say, okay, I'm a practicing teacher and I see how they're learning to teach over here. And that really revealed a lot about their values towards education and how they're still sort of caught up on the memorization and if you don't get it, you need to study harder kind of thing. Well, we, as, we are, I guess we would say we have much more open practices towards teaching and we're much more open to new ideas and trying different things in the classroom. If, if, okay, if this doesn't work, if nobody gets it, well, it's probably our fault. Right, and sort of adapting that attitude, whereas our teachers, were, they were still more textbook-based. Textbook based, and that's, that's okay. That's how they do it. Um, I don't want to go on for too long. I'd love to have somebody else speak if you want to. Sure. Um, to what I learned from my group was a lot. I'm the youngest one on this trip, and some of these people have had so much more teaching experience than I have. Um, however, what I learned from them was just different ways to approach different groups of students. Um, some of them have taught college classes or they've taught at universities or they've taught high schoolers, middle schoolers, and me being with children, <laughs> fourth graders, all day. Um, I think, how can I address them, you know, like young, like future adults? How can I prepare them for the, this group of people and what they're going to possibly teach them one day, if they were to be their teachers. And so that's what I got a lot from that. I would, I would just add to that. Um, I think that it's always interesting because as you travel as a group of Americans, um, it's, it's pretty common to be, you know, I mean, we all do the thing where it's like the group. And so you see people as, you know, parts of a whole. Um, but amongst ourselves, we found incredible diversity in, on many, many levels, not only educational diversity, but background, experience, um, different places where we've taught, uh, different life experiences and cultural backgrounds that we were bringing to things, different linguistic experiences. Um, is, you know, some of us were second language speakers of other languages besides Chinese. Um, and so we... I think one of the takeaways for me was, again, the, and one thing that I do share with my students is there's no such thing as a homogenous group, really. Um, you know, in that we were all American, we brought a certain set of things that we kind of held in common, but we also brought a great deal of diversity into the group. And that really led to a lot of conversations. We had a lot of fun just getting to know each other and really experiencing each other. And then experiencing each other as we experienced all of this because that was another element of all of this, was to have that experience that we were just together in it. And it was a, it was a definitely a bonding experience also, so. Yeah.
how do you address that? Or are you going to address that? Have, do you have a way to address that uh, power dynamic or privilege and mm -hmm. those kind of things in a quick event in your kitchen? Okay. Are you, are you addressing me specifically or just anyone in just the group? Just anyone. Okay. So um, I think the question was uh, most of the participants, actually not all, uh, most of the participants came from fairly privileged background, meaning that they were white Americans, actually not all, um, in the project. Um, and they might have, and also as Americans in general, they might have had more privilege while in China, right? And also we know the global north and versus global south. So the question was well, whether or not they could recall experiences of privilege and how is that and also how they plan to address the issue um, uh, in their teaching is that okay so um, I I was I was uh, signaling to uh, Sandra because that was actually her presentation yesterday uh, so I will let her respond a little bit yeah, I actually, um, I did quite a bit of reflecting um, on privilege in China as well as coming back, and I think we did experience various situations. Um, you always have that, all, you know, that feeling of the, being the other when you are, you know, in the in the out group and you're different, and the linguistic things definitely enhances that, especially with me. I had very little capability in that level, so um, that was one thing that started me thinking about it, but then as, like, as I mentioned in the presentation, we started to talk about inequity in education and access and things like that, which actually led me to start thinking about what are some ways that I can bring my students, who as I mentioned are fairly homogenous as it goes, you know, in terms of being privileged in my setting, um, what are some ways that I can actually bring them into a place where they have to confront that privilege? Um, and one of the things that I uh, actually talked about in a session that I did yesterday was the study that I've been doing in my classroom this year where I've been uh, sort of bringing students to examine things. For instance, we could talk about the system of education in China and what kind of inequality that creates for students and then taking that focus once we've agreed that inequalities exist and, and that they're not optimal for all students, and then taking that focus and turning to similarities in the United States, and even as much as possible in our community in Nebraska, um, or you know, however I can connect that for them. So that is an ongoing thing that I personally am doing um, as far as confronting that particular thing, because that is something that I've experienced in travel in, in different places, um, but it's hasn't been until here recently, I think I've really started to weigh and ponder that and how can I use that to move my students forward to be aware of their own privilege and the responsibility that they have for dealing with that. Um, I also wanted to add um, to the answer two things. Uh, first of all, I think that throughout the program we actually had a lot of discussions about privilege, but more in the Chinese context about the inequality that, the, for example, the, house, the household registration system creates, right? The, the privileges that uh, people, children who grew up in Shanghai would have versus you know, migrant workers. And I think that uh, you know, Sandra's point yesterday about how it's much easier to see the privilege when you are not there. When you look at other contexts, you say, of course, this is wrong. And so I think uh, for, the, for the outcomes, one of the outcomes of our project is that all of the teachers had to design a teaching module in which they would have to design what to teach their students about their experience in China. And many of them actually designed teaching modules about uh, social justice. And so, for example, we have Spanish language teachers who design a module comparing inequalities in China versus, you know, Spanish-speaking contexts, migrants, uh, immigrants, right? How immigrants have similar uh, experience as migrant workers' children in China. So I think a lot of it was actually drawing the parallels and comparisons and thinking about reflecting on the privileges. And I think the other issue is I would like to address is also me as an educator myself. Uh, we do have a diverse uh, group of participants. Um, uh, for example, uh, by reading, they actually I asked it, actually asked them to share their journals with me at, at the end of the project. And uh, I noticed that one of our participants who um, who was um, who from who's from a, a, a a racially minoritized background, let's put it that way, um, 
ha has written in, in, the docu in, in the journal. You know, when I say, for example, as a study abroad researcher and, and practitioner, I'm very used to telling my students, well, in America, we do, way, we do things so-and-so in this way. You know, in China, we do, way, we do things in so-and-so way, such ways. Um, and then he wrote down, which America? Because when I say things like, well, in America, people eat chicken and beef, but in China, it's not uncommon to see, to see for example, organs, you know, pig intestines, for example. Uh, that's because, you know, China has experienced lots of poverty, famine, etc. Food is seen as, or we used to be as a, seen as scarcity, so we have to treasure every, every part. And then later, after reading the documents, I realized, the journals, I realized, wait a minute, by, if you look at African-American communities, it's the case as well, that they have the dietary uh, culture is actually very, very similar. So it's not in America people do so-and-so. It's in white America people do so-and-so. And so how much of our language and foreign culture teaching has been organized or, or designed to cater to the majority of our students who come from privileged background, and we as foreign language educators do not think of that. Um, so that's actually a reflection that I've been having myself. And so um, I hope that answers your question to some extent. Um, and unfortunately, we have to move on to the second part of the presentation, uh, but we will have a few more minutes uh, after the second part. So. Um,